It's a pleasure to talk about um, this uh, long title. Actually, I'm, we're trying to summarize two pieces of work that have been performed um, in order to advance the electrical characterizations of organic semiconductor devices. The first topic here is uh, studying doped layers in these devices, so charge transport layers that are doped. And the second topic is charge transport at internal interfaces. And from the list of uh, people you see that uh, it's really a teamwork. There's a lot of different people involved, starting out with uh, numerical colleagues, Evelyn Knopp and Christoph Kirsch, who have b laid the basis for a numerical framework that allows us to do impedance spectroscopy simulations or also to um, add new physics to the charge transport model at the layer interface. And we have colleagues uh, from the TU Dresden who fabricated uh, devices, PIP devices used in this study. And also, um, yeah, the main people that did this work was Sandra Jenatsch and Stefan Altesen. Um, Stefan Altesen who has uh, suggested some nice uh, new physical model used here. So the, the first uh, part, yeah, it was really um, done by Sandra and uh, in the framework of a European project, uh, most of us. She presented yesterday some unpublished work uh, on TADF OLED degradation studies. So she preferred to present that and suggested that I <laughs> present the uh, older work, which is now in the meantime, luckily, is also available soon as a paper in Journal of Applied Physics. It's in press in, in a week or two. Um, you can also read more details about this study. Um, so I will first discuss this work where uh, as a first comment about material parameter extraction, uh, let us remind what has been done in the community. A traditional approach was that to perform an experiment, for instance, a SCLC JV measurement or a single measurement of a C-lift transient and then extract a certain parameter like the charge mobility. And there's two examples here from the Blakesley uh, in London. They have even come up with a recipe how to properly measure and analyze the SCLC JV curve to extract uh, repeat, uh, reliably the mobility parameter. But the problem is they just looked at one type of experiment. Also, lots of work has been done on sea uh, lift um, mobility determination, as we just heard uh, also this afternoon. Um, but the, there are some issues. So you have only one kind of uh, experiment to analyze, and um, for each, yeah, you can you can just get uh, one parameter that c reproduces this one experiment. Of course, people have extended this kind of traditional approach and um, also did uh, numerical modeling and combined for instance, multiple JV curves for different temperatures and also for devices of different layer thickness. And they have uh, achieved a nice fit across all these curves. But this example also is limited to just one experimental technique, namely JV curves. Um, and the problem with this is that these, uh, the parameters you extract from such a, uh, such a fit are still um, strongly correlated because you have the data is just based on one experimental techniques. And this kind of correlation is also visible in this uh, simulation example here and also shows that analyzing JV curves is not enough. Uh, for instance, if you take a model and we want to study in a solar cell the change in the fill factor, you can reproduce this reduction in fill factor by changing uh, or introducing a trap density and increasing this density. But also you can do a similar thing by adding, uh, changing the mobility ratio in the active layer. And also really like this you can um, get the fill factor that you want uh, to get. So it's, it's an illustration of um, yeah, how non-unique your fit can, can be. Uh, but then if you would add additional experimental techniques, for instance, uh, transient photocurrent, or capacitance voltage measurements, then you see that the same model assumptions, increasing trap intensity, for instance, has a different impact on these techniques. So 
increasing trap density in this case doesn't change transit photocurrent, but um, increasing the mobility ratio has a strong effect on this experiment. So, and the same is true for the C capacitance voltage. They different assumptions have also um, a different influence on these additional experimental curves. Uh, okay, th that's modeling just to illustrate. So this proves that um, m making more um, measurement, using more measurement techniques is um, useful. Oh, I can use this. So now, but um, this afternoon uh, already Martin uh, emphasized this um, that in the OPV study that combining multiple experiments um, is much more um, successful in terms of getting a global fit. And of course, we try to provide uh, tools for that. So the PIOS tool will be presented later this afternoon. And um, it combines DC, AC and transient experiments with one setup. And you get the consistent data. And the modeling tool to that we use is the Setfos tool that also gets similar, gives similar uh, simulation results for AC, DC and transient. And with this approach, we hope to be more sensitive to uh, these, um, these material parameters that we want to extract and end up with a lower correlation among the parameters. And yeah, one successful fit uh, was already shown this afternoon by uh, Martin in the OPV context, so I will skip that. Now let's uh, move on to this OLED device here, uh, studied in the European project. Uh, it is a five-layer OLED, where we have an emission layer in the middle, and all this uh, small molecule devices uh, evaporated, um, they're done in uh, Dresden. And what we want to do here is to make um, divide and conquer. So we want to just focus on PIP first, and we realize that even by simplifying this, picking out some layers and making a whole only device, is already uh, some challenge to get a global fit for JV and um, impedance data, but we succeeded, as you will see in a, in a moment. And on the other side of this device, you can imagine that we also have studied the NIN device, but this is out of scope today, but uh, also there we have some successful fit. Uh, but the publication is only about the whole transport side. So you saw in the previous uh, slide that what are the parameters we want to extract we have a uh, work function that maybe is not so relevant if it's, uh, the contacts are good, if it's highly doped. So we have a doping density that is of interest. We have whole mobilities in the intrinsic layer here. And of course also some uh, homo level that is uh, relevant here and the epsilon dielectric constant. So it's a limited number of unknowns. So we can hope for good to extract these uh, reliably. And the typical measurement results we get are shown here. So there in fabrication, the intrinsic layer thickness was varied. The boundary layers were 30 nanometers thin. They were kept fixed, so the only the intrinsic layer was varied. And as expected, the JV curve is more steep for thinner intrinsic layer. And moreover, the capacitance voltage, uh, the capacitance increases as we um, decrease the thickness because it's a parallel plate a capacitor picture, you uh, get expect a higher capacitance for a thinner device. But what was quite intriguing at first, we didn't really know why do we see here two plateaus in capacitance frequency. So there seems to be a typical shape here. For this very simple device, we get a very re reproducible shape of two plateaus and wasn't clear why this is. And again, the, the thicker the device, um, or yeah, I the thinner, the higher the capacitance, the thicker, the lower the capacitance, so the trend is, is good. And uh, moreover, the, if you look at the exact numbers, the value of capacitance drops from 3 to 1.5, so we just uh, decreases by a factor of 2, and that is ex as expected from yeah, going from 100 to 200 nanometer uh, thick. So it indicates that um, in this measurement, we don't really see the doped layers. We really see there's just the intrinsic layer. So it seems to be well behaved. And uh, wait. 
But the question is still, okay, um, now I've, I've mentioned the, the measurement curves, but already here you see the comparison of measurement and simulation. The simulation are these uh, dashed lines and they can nicely reproduce the JV curves as well as the capacitance voltage curves and also the capacitance uh, frequency curves. And also here on this side you see that these two plateaus are, are nicely uh, reproduced as we've seen them in the experiment. And what about the reliability of these uh, values that we extracted? It's of course um, an important question and uh, Martin also emphasized today that uh, correlation can be mathematically analyzed. And But first of all, remember the example. Uh, this was an example um, where we have uh, two parameters that we could change in the model and they have both of them have the same effect on the signal that we generate here. So these would be highly correlated. And for this particular PIP device, the fit um, for these three layer thicknesses of devices, the successful fits gives us this uh, correlation matrix where luckily we get quite low numbers here in the correlation coefficients. So um, low correlations is good. It means that we have reliably extracted these parameters. And the values of these parameters are hole injection barrier, mobility in this DPBIC, that's the whole transport material uh, used here in the intrinsic layer as well as in the doped layers. And the, the so that's the shear field mobility and the field dependent uh, coefficient for the mobility, the gamma, and then also the epsilon and uh, the doping density as well. So that's uh, quite um, successful, but correlation is one thing, but there's another thing we should also care about is sensitivity. And in order to illustrate sensitivity, uh, Sandra was um, taking the, the simulation, the, the fit, the, the good fit with these values and looking at how would these generated signals, how would they change as we modify the model parameters. So the zero field mobility we can in increase by a factor of 10 or decrease by a factor of 10. And you see that the JV, CF and C voltage are strongly changing. So that uh, tells us that uh, the uh, mobility, zero field mobility prefactor has a very high sensitivity. So so that's good. If a parameter has a strong influence on the signal, that's good. Then we can reliably extract it. So it's we are sensitive to this model parameter. But the last example down here is wh when if we modify the epsilon. So we were, so the epsilon was not correlated to the other parameters. But um, still, we should be a bit careful because the, if we change the value of epsilon, we see not much influence on the signals uh, that we generate there. So we can write here we have a low sensitivity on this uh, parameter epsilon. So meaning, yeah, epsilon maybe would be better to, to do some additional experiments to confirm epsilon. Now, um, the sensitivity can actually uh, be improved uh, if we go to a temperature dependent study. So we um, were also measuring these PIP devices at different temperatures from 230 Kelvin up to 313. As expected, the current scales strongly with the uh, temperature and also the capacitance frequency has uh, systematic changes in the measurement. And it's interesting that for if we cool down the device, then this uh, increase of capacitance is shifted to lower frequencies. And uh, then of course the, the question is what uh, these kind of plateaus that we can kind of recognize what is the meaning of these plateaus and since we had three device thicknesses available it's possible to just rescale the capacitance the measured capacitance multiply by the in this case uh, the intrinsic layer thickness and double check if this would be indeed uh, if the plateau at this frequency here uh, you see the capacitance coincide after rescaling with the intrinsic layer thickness. So that kind of confirms that the first plateau here is corresponding to the um, parallel plate capacitor of the, f of the intrinsic layer. Similarly, uh, there is another kind of plateau lower down here. 
and uh, lower capacitance usually means it's a thicker parallel plate capacitor and indeed if we rescale the measured data multiply C by the total device thickness rather than just the intrinsic device thickness then we see also that the, the value collapses here and uh, kind of confirms that the initial plateau here is uh, the one representing the full device which is at yeah so which is uh, kind of uh, depleted at uh, yeah, at this uh, high frequency. And uh, for the simulation of this kind of um, data, we of course have to introduce a temperature dependent model, so we can use a field and temperature dependent mobility model that is uh, parameterized as shown here with an activation energy and some T0 as well. And we, using the f this uh, fancy global fitting algorithms that Martin presented before, um, you can get a successful fit and the result is shown down here. So we have uh, in the model as well a strong dependence of on the temperature for the JV and also for the capacitance frequency. And interestingly in the simulation these plateaus are appearing very distinctively, um, very clearly and in the measurement it's not uh, that clear, but we believe it's um, a, a good agreement. And in this case, the doing the temperature dependence, we get a sensitivity for all these parameters, we get uh, quite high sensitivity. So all of these parameters have a s uh, strong influence on the, on the signal that we get. So, um, yeah, if you have time to measure temperature dependence, it's uh, advised to do so. Yeah. And finally, now you still uh, maybe wonder uh, what's the reason well, for these plateaus. Um, we could, um, thanks to the simulation, we can, after having a good fit, we can look ins inside the device and see where are the carriers. Um, so first of all, in remember in an impedance analysis, we do a small signal analysis. We are solving first for the DC, uh, the DC case where we can plot the profile of the DC component and the small signal part would be the, the AC component here but in the DC already what we see is that in the doped layers the free carrier density here is um, yeah, agreeing well with the doping density that we have uh, put selected in the model so these boundary layers are highly conductive because of doping and then inside the device we have a nice U shape uh, very symmetric um, shape of, of charge is that also uh, is consistent with the symmetric JV curve. And then the AC part, um, it's more difficult to interpret but you can already see depending on the frequency we can plot the AC hole distribution and we see for high frequency we only um, oscillate the charges that are at the boundary of the intrinsic layer and at low frequency the mobility is good enough that such that the carriers can move uh, quite deeply into the, into the device and that's the reason why we have a second plateau at low frequency that the carriers start to oscillate not only at the boundary of the intrinsic layer but also uh, charge oscillates also uh, inside, uh, penetrates further into the intrinsic layer. So thanks to the the inside view of the model we were able to also understand uh, why we have these two plateau and it turns out that uh, this two plateau uh, is also a good proof that you have good context if you would have less charge carry doping you might have uh, some more uh, barrier for charge transport across this boundary layer and then you wouldn't have this nice uh, second plateau here so you can um, abuse this observation also to check the quality of the contact or the quality of the doped layers and um, yeah the mobility the mobility of the carriers inside the intrinsic layer also influences uh, has a strong relation to the frequency at which we shift from the first plateau to the second plateau so that's uh, a successful um, study and it's a uh, yeah, basic step to very quantitative uh, simulation of OLEDs because then these parameters you can feed them into the five layer OLED. Okay, and the second study um, we uh, re revisited the physical model of uh, charge transport. Okay, the, the diffusion model I, I don't have to introduce again, it's just uh, 
uh, these three equations uh, if you have uh, electron only. And the question is now, we wanted to refine the, the model of uh, charge transport at the interface. And usually what is common to use in drift diffusion is assuming thermal equilibrium. And that basically means if you ha look at the charge carry density of electrons on the right-hand side of, a, of, a, of an interface, so um, at the LUMO discontinuity, you can relate the density on the right to the density of carriers on the left by uh, just enforcing this uh, equilibrium condition with the Boltzmann factor. That's the uh, easiest thing to do, but it's quite brute force. It kind of, uh, it's a strong assumption. And what we wanted to do is to relax this um, request and think about something more physical and uh, locally to consider a hopping process uh, where the hopping could, uh, similarly as assumed in uh, KMC or master equation approach, to look at the Miller-Abraham's hopping rate, where the hopping rate would depend on the available sites on the target layer on the right-hand side. If we hop, the, this electron wants to hop from layer one to layer two, then the neighboring sites have a different energy, and that also affects the rate. And then the end, um, yeah, we would want to integrate over all the, uh, the whole plane, so Y and Z plane, and end up with a, with a rate that we can use. And, uh, and of course, we shouldn't uh, just consider up, um, r hoping uphill in energy, but also downhill in energy. So in the end, in equilibrium, we will have a balance between up and down hopping. And if we have the good model, then we also should reproduce the, the current density should in the end be zero. And indeed, with our formalism, we can reproduce this uh, thermal equilibrium. And I think I should speed up, I heard. <laughs> um, <laughs> so th these are the details also described in the, model in the paper. Um, so we have, um, in the drift diffusion model, we have the typical discretization of elements in the layer first organic material and the second organic material. And the current should be uh, uh, continuous here. But uh, locally, we have to describe the, the current in a hopping context. If we succeed, then what do we want to apply it to? Um, not only for electron transport across LUMO discontinuities, also whole transport for HOMO discontinuities. But then, so that's, uh, of course, uh, relevant. But what is very interesting is also to, to extend this formalism to charge transfer from the HOMO, if an electron can hop to the LUMO on the neighboring layer, then we would um, call this um, charge generation. And we would also allow for recombination. If an electron is sitting here in the LUMO and it would want to hop to the HOMO on this side, then we have uh, recombination. And uh, the last, that's just for completeness. That's something that is uh, less likely because it's a huge energy barrier. Um, so, but the, the central one, this one is very relevant for some class of devices, namely for stacked devices. If you want to model tandem solar cell or tandem OLEDs, you really need to consider this process. And we have to admit that so far in, in uh, our software set for you were not able to simulate any uh, OPV tandem device or OLED tandem device. But now with this new formalism, we are able to do that. So in the OL stacked OLED, you would have uh, an interface, for instance, a, a PN junction between upper and lower OLED unit, where you can generate holes and electrons. And for tandem solar cells, you want to allow for recombination at this interface. And we have some, not new experiments, but we l s found in the literature some nice uh, previous studies by the Adachi group in 2009, some old uh, paper where they have um, investigated uh, a bilayer device, which uh, was not uh, interesting to look at forward bias, but rather into reverse bias. And a very similar study was also uh, published by the Wolfgang Brittings group, uh, sim same year even. Um, then it took us 11 years to model this device. <laughs> Finally, we managed to reproduce. So interestingly, in the 
forward bias, look at the measurement first, these blue lines, you see that in the forward bias um, you would have a huge internal barrier for electrons to overcome. So in the forward uh, direction you don't expect much uh, current. But then if you go into the negative voltage direction, the measurement shows you that there is much more uh, current, so this internal interface acts like a source of carrier. So you have charge generation because of this strong uh, shift in HOMO LUMO and uh, this uh, LUMO on the one side uh, and the HOMO on the other side are, are very nearby and we can, with this, this new model now we can, you see it's qualitative, it's not yet quantitative, but qualitatively our simulation uh, also gives us a high current density in reverse and a smaller one in forward bias and that's the same for, for this device over here. So qualitatively we already are happy and interestingly not only this kind of uh, charge generation, CGI, we call it CGI, charge generation interface, um, charge generation interface is also happening in OLEDs where uh, uh, Hudson layers are used. Hudson layers are charge injection layers which have a very low-lying homolumo values where originally you would not expect any injection from holes across this huge barrier from ITO to the HOMO down here. So that's uh, very unlikely. Rather what we uh, expect is that there is an electron hopping to the LUMO on the left on the Hudson side and leaving behind a hole that can be then injected in the other OLED layer. So it turns out experimentally this is really uh, working well and is a good injection layer for OLEDs. And in the model, so now we are able to simulate that and we find that indeed uh, this generation process generates electrons shown in red in the Hudson layer and also uh, leaves behind the holes shown in blue. So we have this interface where we have a hole and electron generation and that um, allows for good supply of holes for the emission layer which is the yellow layer here. And tandem devices is the last application. Um, so Hudson as an injection layer can be modeled, but also tandem devices. So we looked at two kinds of devices, organic tandem solar cell, very simplified, uh, two polymer uh, layers. So the active layer is a polymer with the same band gap. So we're making a homo tandem where um, adding uh, two identical band gap tandems basically means uh, okay you you can expect to increase the VOC to double the VOC but because the absorbers are not a different band gap the photocurrent is decreasing but it all behaves as expected so um, we go from the green line from a single cell to the blue line which is a tandem cell but now we also need to mention that uh, it's common to dope to the dope these um, charge recombination layers. So we have to introduce this charge doping as in the first part of the talk. We can uh, add dopants into the charge transport layers in our model and that gives us then a good fill factor. So then we can actually um, have good uh, transport across the layer. Otherwise it's too much uh, resisting but adding doping um, also creates a local field that then also helps to uh, for this uh, recombination process. And in the OLED it's uh, similar. We go from the single, J, uh, single OLED JV which is the green one and go to the blue one which is uh, the stacked one without doping and also here if we add doping then uh, the junction works better and we can have more current density in the OLED. So that's um, qualitatively how, how far we got and uh, looking into the device cross-section also confer uh, yeah, con confirms that uh, it seems to behave well. For the solar cell we look here at uh, 0 0.8 I think that's I think this this or about one volt um, views or uh, maybe you know it was the MPP I think it was the MPP so we are here at uh, about one volts at this point here. We look at the charge distribution 
and we see the band diagram and the difference between the quasi Fermi energy here uh, for holes and the one on for electrons over here that's really the voltage that we measure at the device so indeed we have a sum of the voltage uh, dropped in this first and the second cell so the serial connection is nicely um, working the carry densities are shown down here and for the OLEDs also here we now have uh, applied 8 volts and we have the, the 8 volts are between this and that value over here we have um, yeah, consistent picture so physical model allows us to have a look inside the device and understand what's going on so I can conclude here um, that uh, hopefully we uh, can show you that in the first study by looking at JV combined with CF and CV uh, we were able to um, have very sensitive determination of material parameters and that this combination of measurement is required to, to uh, get that. Um, combining measurement and simulation um, helps us to get reliable parameters and uh, finally we're, we're happy that now we have a simulation tool that can uh, simulate tandem devices and not only single uh, devices. Um, finally I would like to thank our collaborators so with interdisciplinary team between uh, Flux staff members Tetavi and Theo Dresden funding and I would like to thank you for your attention and also uh, suggest if you're interested uh, to see the demo uh, of Pios uh, that Martin gives after the break I think and tomorrow afternoon we also have some Setfos uh, training session if you want to play around a bit and learn about uh, physical models in Setfos as well. Okay, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.